Hey everyone, welcome to week 45. This is day four. This is Thursday. This is our ongoing Look Elsewhere week. On Monday, we painted a foam cord. On Tuesday, we painted one of Danny's uh, wood carvings. Uh, yesterday, we painted 653. That's all it is. <laughs> and today, uh, I'm gonna do something that I noticed that I don't think I ever, ever do. I think the first moment in which I felt I was doing it was on Tuesday. And today I kind of repeat this and enhance it a little bit. So you'll see what it is. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is Thursday. This is day four. This is our post uh, 653 day in our... <laughs> in our Look Elsewhere week. And I think yesterday's painting is in many ways a tough act to follow because where do you go from there, from that feeling of complete arbitrariness? So where do we go from there? Like, what did that teach us? If it teaches us that we could just paint anything, like literally anything without an ounce of questioning and just execute the essence of you know, whatever it is that we pick. Is that the lesson that we got from yesterday? Is that a place where we can grow from? I actually don't know. I, I'm, I'm not saying yesterday's painting is highly conceptual or post-conceptual. I don't even know what it is. I think it's far simpler than that. I think it's just 653. It's a painting that, like I said yesterday, it's almost like self-justifying. I kind of feel excited about that. I feel it's wonderful that a space that can you know, spur contemplation like painting is, um, becomes a space of, I wouldn't say like, you know, these single truths. Because if I say the painting is what it is and it is 653 and that is it, as much as I would want it to be, it's not a closed conversation. I'm sure that we could go to a pub and have a bunch of beers and talk awesome and absolute nonsense about 653 and what's cool about that painting and what's ridiculous about that painting and what could actually come from that painting and that it could be, you know, in many ways life altering or that it could be absolutely useless and pointless. And it was just a waste of a couple of hours of painting and trying to justify it as a quote unquote serious painting. is just a fool's errand. But I don't feel I need to construct a manifesto on top of 653. I think it works in the context of this week. If the way we wanted to engage with this week's theme was to look in places that we never really considered as valuable or interesting, well, then that was the place. And I guess that the execution, like the choices about the execution matter. That's the coolest thing about painting, that every single choice that we make matters. We don't need to necessarily back it up, but we need to be conscious about those choices. And many times we don't really understand those choices and it's gonna take a little bit of time for us, the people that make the paintings, it's gonna take us a little time to comprehend those choices. So this is not an immediate thing. This is not a given. It doesn't mean that every time that we sit down and paint, we know exactly what we're doing, we're fully conscious of the choices that we're making, and that those reasons are gonna be readily apparent and available to us so that we can explain them and share them. No, sometimes we are in the dark and that is completely fine. And it will take time for us to understand why we painted something the way we painted it or why we chose a particular subject matter. That is only normal. I think I spoke about this, you know, many, many weeks back. What we usually encounter with painting or with many, many creative projects is that the creation part doesn't really go hand in hand with the reflective part. So maybe the part that actually speaks about the execution of the project is actually miles ahead of the reflection that is accompanying the project. You know, there are going to be times in our lives where we are super productive and we can spend two, three years just, you know, in our cases, painting, 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 and we're gonna produce a ton of paintings. And there are gonna be times where we are just fed up with what we've painted and we have to try and figure out what our next step is gonna be. And it maybe it takes us, you know, a couple of weeks, maybe it takes us a couple of months to try and figure out the direction that we're gonna carve our path towards. 
that takes time and to rush that is useless honestly because there is no way of rushing it or there is but there's no point in rushing it so for me yesterday i think it's a great painting because i think it's nonsense but at the same time i think it's fantastic the fact that i can just give in and say well this is a stupid painting let me believe in it and let me take it 100 seriously i think that that's awesome when i can see an act of painting that is finite when I can see something that may have an impact, but when I can see an image that is being born and then it just is, and effectively it just kind of dies in the sense that uh, I don't see what I can develop from it as a painting. You know, maybe it does change my mind in terms of conceptually how I view painting, but as a painting, I just love the fact that it can just be. It can be a single painting, and I love that. So. Where do we go from there? <laughs> I think it's very, very hard to actually say, okay, this is a stepping stone for my next paintings. I, I think I had a naturalist urge to, um, to paint for today. And I actually had to go back to uh, Tuesday's painting, to that uh, wood carving of Danny's. I'm going to take you guys on this trip that is actually super, super exciting. I love art. I love painting. And, and connecting things in painting with things that I'm trying to solve Oh, it's so delicious. You know, it's so amazing. You know, it brings a smile to my face. It makes me feel connected to everything. So I absolutely love this. So let's take this trip together. So I was thinking of Danny and I was thinking of that wood carving. And immediately my mind was like, well, whenever I think of wood carving, I immediately think of one of my favorite artists and it's Manolo Valdez. And Manolo Valdez has these series of infantas where you can actually spot all the uh, joints in the wood. So the uh, construction of this very, you know, iconic form, iconic obviously for Spanish people, but I love the sort of disjointed construction with this beautiful finish that is being held together by this, again, this very iconic shape. So again, Danny's wood carving threw my mind towards Manolo Valdez. And when I was looking at his sculpture, I also looked at these heads that are sort of assemblages. And when I saw these heads, I remember a Michael Borman's painting of a sculpture that is titled The Prop. And obviously these are not quite the same pieces, but they just gave me the same vibe. And I was trying to tie together the experience that I had had while painting Danny's sculpture work. When I was looking at Borman's painting, I was like, that's so nice. It, it feels almost like artificial, which I really, really like. But I don't really have that feeling with the painting that I did of Danny's small sculpture. So I was like, ah, oh, this is so cool about Borman's that he can have this very weird disconnected effect because, again... I had felt connected with the painting that I had done of Danny's work, but the reason I had felt connected is because I was deeply connected beforehand, before the painting act, to the subject matter, to her intent, to her reason for doing these wood carvings. And I couldn't really comprehend how I could have felt, you know, this sense of disconnect, this sense of artificiality when looking at this uh, sculpted piece. So I started thinking, well, maybe that's something that's part of Boriman's work, part of the nature of his work. And immediately I went to some of his paintings that have to do with scale, which are by far my favorite paintings of his. A lot of people love Boriman's paintings where he depicts his subject matter in this sort of void, empty space, and it feels very singular. But I actually love the paintings that have to do with scale, where he actually displays this world almost like a scenery. It really does feel like a set, like a little model set. My mind immediately goes to like these elaborate train sets. And then he puts people working on these quote unquote sets. But, but when you look at it, it does feel like it's nature. It feels like it's natural. But there's also this sense of artificiality that I had felt, you know, when he painted that sculpture. It doesn't feel, and I'm gonna draw this parallel because I'm gonna bring back a painting that we had seen a couple of weeks back, this gorgeous painting of the uh, Colossus. This is a ridiculous painting because this beast is clearly not part of the natural order, so much so that when it shows up, chaos ensues and everyone and everything is just running for their lives, except, we talked about this, except the donkey. The donkey stays still because he's boss. It's so strange for me to say, yeah, that actually feels more natural. That Colossus getting ready to destroy a town and eat everyone and everything feels more natural 
than the figures that are part of these sets in Boreman's paintings. They, they feel disconnected in a way because it feels like they're almost tending to this bit of nature, to this small set of nature. They're almost like taking care of this kind of slice of landscape. So it's pretty amazing that they are actually connecting with this very strange moment of nature. And yet their relationship is really bizarre to me. And it obviously has to do with scale. But like I said, you know, the Colossus painting in Goja also has to do with scale. And I understand it as plausible even. Scale is such a wonderful thing. It can give such a bizarre effect that it's really unsettling. And this got me to thinking, and we're going to finally talk about today's painting, about the sense of scale in my own paintings and how I've dealt or not really dealt with this. So I started kind of going back in my mind and looking at, you know, almost every single painting that I've done, going back and thinking about if there's any particular painting where I had spoken about scale and I couldn't come up with anything. You know, the only thing that I've ever done larger than life was this series of portraits that I painted on top of reproductions of the uh, Raft of the Medusa that were of my family. And they were about 150% life size. We're not talking about Chuck Close, you know, dimensions. These were, yes, larger than life, but nothing extraordinary, I would say. And when I was thinking about objects, you know, the uh, still lifes that I've painted throughout the years, I was like... I don't think I've ever, ever painted anything that is larger than life. I don't think I've ever really experimented with the dimensions of my subject matter. So I told myself one thing. I can speak about dimensions, and I could have actually made a painting that was evidently larger than life. A wooden clothespin that was far larger than life. I could have made it about four times its size. But I told myself, what if I make it slightly larger? What if it's between 150% and twice its size? And I was like, yeah, that could be very, very cool. And I challenged myself, and this is like a very weird thing to do, but I was like, what if this clothespin is actually in the space that is absolutely neutral? It's just gonna be a space that has atmosphere in it, but that's about it. There's no elements in there that could give you a sense of scale. But what if our relationship with this object can actually be affecting the way we see this slightly larger than life clothespin. What if I can speak about the awkward quality that I love about those uh, Boreman's paintings and do it without all those elements and all those dynamics that he puts into a painting? What if I try to do that? And honestly, this is a super complex undertaking because the more elements you have, the more relationships you can create and scale, in a sense, needs of those relationships because it's inherent to the nature of scale to speak about relationships. So what if there are no things to relate to it, you know, within the painting, but the relationship that we have to establish lies actually in the experience of the observer. And I thought that that was super, super interesting. There's a lot of the painting that is actually being activated outside of the painting. It's asking of you to activate a relationship that you may or may not have with this, you know, very, very simple object. And in, in terms of the formal execution of it, it just gave me a chance to hone in on this object. Again, this is something that I never, ever do. So this was a really interesting experiment. It wasn't just about painting something slightly larger. It was about us as observers, perhaps feeling like we have to establish a new dynamic between ourselves and this object that is recognizable, but it actually feels new because it is larger and it's being presented to us in a way that is different from our own experience. So in many ways, you know, and this is what I thought, we actually become those people in the Boromans paintings. The important thing is not that we feel literally like those people, because those people would have to be dealing with this uh, small version of nature. And it's not about replicating that exact relationship. No, it's actually tapping into that feeling of us being part of this new nature. And I wanted to see if I could do that. And it's very strange. And I think that this is one of those paintings that unfortunately, because we are looking at it in a YouTube video, or because we are looking at it as this tiny image in our phone screens, we're not really going to have that same relationship as we would have 
if we were dealing with the actual object of the painting. But again, that's the nature of, of socializing painting online. So I accept those uh, restrictions and the sacrifices that we have to do. But I loved uh, this experience. When deciding to reflect upon the painting of Danny's whittling, it took me to Manolo Valdez's uh, wooden sculptures, which then took me to his assemblages, which then reminded me of a Michael Boreman's painting, which then reminded me of the paintings that I connect with the most in his work, which then made me think about scale, which made me <laughs> realize that I have never actually dealt with scale in my work. And I was like, yeah, I can look into this and I can try to see what I can come up with. This is like my playground. I love to look at art and I love to try and connect everything and to connect it in a way that makes sense for me because what I don't want, and this is perhaps me shielding myself, but what I don't want is for somebody to come in and say, well, actually, Mikhail Boreman's paintings, they don't speak about that. They speak about this other thing. It's like, no, don't ruin it for me. I want to believe this about those paintings. Don't kill it for me. Like when I reflect upon those paintings and I create this little fiction, I can use that fiction to then spur a creative process that ends up being my own painting. So for me, it's essential that we don't really ruin paintings for other people. That was it for today's effort. I had a blast painting it and I had um, an awesome time just trying to understand my relationship with it as an object. So it was super, super cool. Tomorrow we're gonna finish the week with something that's quite difficult for me, but I also want it to be very, very simple. But I want to have that experience and I think it's gonna be super cool. But that's gonna be tomorrow. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you, bye.